Right. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, coffee and snacks upstairs. Flapjacks were very nice. Uh, to get us started again, uh, we have another senior engineer from our Python infrastructure team, uh, Laszlo. Laszlo also contributes uh, to uh, various PyPA projects, including uh, PIP and Audit Wheel, I think you said? <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, he'll be talking to us a little bit about PIP and Pac-Man today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it working? Yeah, it's working. So good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I am, I'm Lasla, working the uh, Python infrastructure team in Bloomberg. And I'm here today to talk to you about, or to tell you a tale of package managers. Let's start by saying, um, by making the statement that managing Python packages is actually simple. Many people will say, I guess mostly seasoned Python users, that this is not, this, this is actually true and why even give a talk about it? My experience is that, uh, especially novice users, new, new people to Python, um, struggle to work with Python packages. They can find issues when they encounter permission denied issues or incompatible dependencies, or they just struggle to figure out what is the right tool to in, uh, install packages in Python. So in this talk today, I'm going to try to go through a few examples and get to a few best practices to see how can we make managing Python actually simple, because I do think it is actually simple. So let's start off by actually looking at what are package managers. Um, they are tools to install, search, remove, and just you know do general operations with uh, Python packages. When we're talking about uh, Python packaging, we definitely probably all know pip, which is the main, by far, most popular package manager in Python. Does anyone know what pip stands for? No? Um, it stands for pip installs packages, right? It's pretty cool, huh? So pip is um, an open source project. It's uh, very robust and used by a lot of people. It does all of those things I mentioned earlier, uh, plus a lot of other things. Um, it's a very advanced tool. By default, it will install packages from PyPI, the cheese shop. So this makes it possible for us to get access to the, all, all those amazing open source uh, projects from PyPI. But you can also use it to install local packages or use private indices and, and a lot more. On the other side, we have package managers from the Unix-like or like the operating system package managers, um, which are like apt, yum, pacman, and, and many others. These are much more general purpose package managers. Uh, they usually take the upstream source packages, uh, potentially apply patches to them, run a test suite. If there are extensions um, which need to be compiled, they will compile them and package them up for the appropriate distribution. This means that these are generally, these work better on any given distribution because they are well tested for that particular distribution. But it also means that it takes more work to get them to work, which means that the selection is generally smaller, much smaller than what you would be uh, able to get on PyPI, and the updates are generally slower. So there is a trade-off there. So the question is, and actually before I, before I get to the next one, I just want to quickly mention that this is, a, this is a short talk, and I'm completely going to just avoid Windows and Conda, and I'm very sorry about that. It's a very, very important area, but I just don't have time to talk about it today. Um, if you do have questions, I, we can talk maybe after the, after the presentation. So yes, I'm sorry, but I'm going to focus on Unix-like operating systems and, and mostly Linux. So which one should we use? The big question. Uh, and the question is, of, or the answer is, of course, it depends. And it depends on many factors. But I think it makes sense to look at things like uh, how or where do you want to install these packages. And it's, it's useful to separate installations into categories like system-wide package installations. What these are are basically, a, when we talk about the system-wide package installation, we consider one global package installation location, which is shared across that machine by all users for that particular uh, Python interpreter. Let's see how this works. So we Google, we are a brand new user to Python and we, we just want to try some fancy package we found on the internet and we 
we want to try it out, we Google, how do I install Python packages? And then we get the answer on Stack Overflow or somewhere, oh, you just pip install package name. All right, so let's do that. Uh, pip install pyaml, let's, let's see we install pyaml. And we get comment not found. Pip is actually not installed. Okay, that's interesting, so what do we do with that? Um, so pip is actually part of the CPython distribution. So if you download it um, from python.org, you should get it to the installer, but on many Linux distributions, it's actually split into a separate package. So you do have to install it separately. In this case, we actually use pacman, the Arch uh, Linux package manager, to install python-pip to get um, pip installed. Um, depending on your distribution, you'll have to see how exactly you do this, but you can already see that you already need the operating system package manager to install the Python package to get this to work. Okay, so we have that. Next thing. And before we move on, I want to give you a tip, which is that don't do that. Do this instead. Um, if you run pip install, that's going to invoke pip with whatever version that pip was installed for, whatever version of Python was installed for. And unfortunately, still today, there are many people using distributions where pip or Python is on 2.7 which means that now you're installing a pip, um, calling pip to Python 2.7, and you're installing packages to Python 2.7's side packages. Uh, you might not actually want that, and it can be very confusing when you are not able to import packages with Python 2.7. So yeah, just um, explicitly specify the interpreter and use minus and pip. Uh, it's going to save you headaches. Okay, so now we all know all that, and we actually start to install a package um, Python 3.7 and minus and pip install pyaml, and what we get is a permission denied error uh, right here. Why is this happening? So what happens here is that pip is trying to install into user lib Python 3.7 site packages, which is the global site on this machine. This is, uh, like I said, shared by all users on the machine, so you won't be able to install as any uh, regular user into that, um, only root general or administrative uh, users can do that. Okay, so what do we do in this case? We run the same thing with sudo, right? What else? <laughs> Let's do that. And yeah, no errors. It worked. Excellent, right? <laughs> Everything works. What can go wrong? We have a problem though. So now let's say a few days later we find this cool project called Beats, which we don't even realize is written in Python and we install it on our favorite Linux distribution with Pacman. And then it turns out it is indeed written in Python and it depends on this YAML Python package, which we've just installed with pip using sudo. And now um, the package manager says, says error, fail to commit transaction conflicting files. When it's trying to install p files into this location, which we've just installed files to with pip. Um, so yes, there is an inconsistency between the package manager's internal view of what should be installed and what is actually installed because we have basically messed up that global site. Um, so this is a bad situation to be in and it's actually, it can be quite tricky to clean it up. Uh, so pseudo pip is not a good idea. Um, it's going to cause problems. Now, there's another thing here which is important to mention. Uh, executing setup.py as root is a bad idea. Uh, setup.pi is by far the most popular way of implementing the build and installation steps in Python projects. Uh, this is changing today uh, or nowadays, but still this is by far the most popular way to install uh, Python packages. So essentially when you do pip install with sudo, you're executing a Python script with root privileges and anything can be in that setup.py script. So for example, I wrote a nice example here um, let's just import shutl and rm3 everything on root and just for good measure ignore all the errors to make sure it works. And you might think this is, this is silly, no one's going to do this, right? But what if I name this url lib and then I upload it to PyPI and all the people who think that the popular url lib library, which is actually spelled url lib 3, is the one they're installing and they miss that 3 with sudo, they'll run this with root, which is really bad, right? Um, and actually, this, this is called typo squatting, and in 2017, uh, there was a similar ex uh, incident on the PyPA or, or PyPI where uh, some unknown person uh, impersonated several packages 
and the downloaded set of the PI uh, scripts were just collecting information from the machine, so nothing malicious happened, but anything, anything could have been uh, done in those scripts. So uh, actually, the PSF is actually funding projects uh, on the Pi PI to make this more difficult or, or just to improve the security, but uh, it is still a really bad idea to run uh, pip with sudo. Okay, so what have we learned about system-wide package installations? Well, I think the biggest takeaway, what I can say here, is that just use the iOS package manager. Just, just stick to that, because that's going to work best. Um, if the package is available, obviously, because the package selection is much smaller, you should just do this. You'll be fine. Um, so apt, pacman, or yum, or whatever your favorite um, Linux distribution uses. What happens, though, if the package is not available? Um, whatever you want to install is just not available in the package repository. Oops, it's falling apart. Um, yeah, so in that case, we can use non-system-wide installations. These are ways of installations where we restrict the installation into uh, maybe a user's home directory or even to just a separate directory and we don't interfere with any other package installations, other users on the machine um, or anything else. So the, the simplest way of doing this is with um, the user, user site installation. So this is something Python has supported since 2.6, so it's really widely available. And we can use it with pip install my experience user. If you do this, well, let's try it. And we let's install this uh, uh, not so well known but a very cool project called Black. And what you see is that everything works fine. It just installs it. There is a warning here, which we're going to ignore here, but I'll come back to that. Um, the installation just works fine. And then let's see, let's see what is in our system path. Sprint that. And you see that there is this directory on sys.path, which is in .local under my home. This is the user site. And if anything is in that direct, if that directory exists, then CPython will put it on the path and it will look for files there when you're trying to import something. So this is what the minus minus user um, argument does in pip. So now, if we try to import black and print where the file is from, you can see that it is indeed installed into dot .local under my home, into the Python 3.7 site uh, over there. So it's great, everything works and it's really simple. You don't have to use sudo or anything. Now, if we, want to, if we want to run the black script though, that's not going to work unless we put this .local bin uh, directory on the path. And this is what the warning was referring to from pip because it was smart enough to detect that we don't have that directory on the path and it can't really do much other than telling us that you need to do this. Uh, it's a one-time setup, it's really easy to do. And after that, everything just works as expected. So this is cool. But there is a but, and that is that basically all applications and libraries installed with minus minus user will share the same location. And this means that if you have application A, which depends on uh, some library uh, with one particular version, and then you have another application which depends on the same library but with a different version, that's not going to work because you can only have one version of that library available in the user site. And, um, to overcome this, we can use virtual environments. So virtual environments take this a uh, step further, basically they, they contain an entire virtual Python installation in a single directory. Um, they do some, it does some clever tricks to make it seem like it's an actual full blown Python installation. Uh, it is not really, it's, it's kind of, it's really lightweight, um, but it works really well. It is actually built into Python since uh, the release 3.3. Uh, so you can just use minus mdm and it will work. You don't have to install anything. If you, if you happen to use some older version, a legacy Python for whatever reason, you can use the awesome virtual length package. Just install it from PyPI using either your OS package manager or minus minus user as we've just learned. And then you can do Python minus m minus uh, uh, virtual length. Okay, so how do we actually use this thing? Um, it takes two steps to get to a virtual environment. First of all, we just run 
Pandemetry 7 minus 3 amp minus MV amp, and then we, the name of the environment, and this is the name of the directory which will be created where the environment will live. It will be created in the current directory, and that's all done. And then we have to activate it. The activation is basically just uh, sourcing this activate script from the environment itself. And this activate script does a few things. For example, it updates our prompt to show us uh, the name of the environment that we are inside the virtual environment. It will also update a few environment variables to make sure that everything is contained within that environment and everything works as intended. Uh, and it will save the previous values of those environments, uh, environment values. Okay, now let's try to use this. If now we try to install a package, we can just go ahead and pip install. And in this case, this is perfectly fine. You don't need to write out explicitly the interpreter version because uh, there's only one interpreter in this case, self-contained environment. Um, and yeah, everything just works as expected. No warnings, it's installed. And inside this virtual lamp, if we again try to import black and then look at the file, we see that it is indeed in the my VM directory, and it lives there, uh, self-contained. If we try to run it, it also works. Nothing, we didn't have to change anything because the activation script updated our path, so it's already available uh, to use. If we want to exit the virtual environment, we have to call this special deactivate function, which is also something the activation script made available. And then everything goes back to normal. It restores all the environment variables, and total amnesia, nothing works anymore, black is not there, like nothing happened. The director obviously is still there, so you can just go back again and activate it and use it. Uh, we don't actually have to activate it. We c what we can do is, um, if, we, if we just write out the full path and then to, to a script in the main director and try to execute it, it will work perfectly fine. And that is because virtual and rewrites the shebangs. So the first line of the script uh, and it will put the Python interpreter inside the VM onto the, onto the shebang line. So this will actually work perfectly fine. You will be able to potentially put this directory on your path and just use the tools from over there. You only need to activate it if you want to make modifications, you want to install scripts, or you want to do development and you really want to import things, for example, from the, from the virtual end. Okay, so now with all that, what have we learned? Um, Let's recap. Do not install packages, pip, pip system-wide. Besides the fact that it's probably not even possible, um, it's going to cause issues, especially if we do it as root. And that is also going to expose us to potential security issues. So just avoid this. Um, instead, use apt, pacman, yum, or your favorite package manager to install uh, Python packages system-wide if you can. Um, but it's better to prefer non-system-wide installations. Uh, user mode installations, if you want to keep it simple and you just want to make a tool available to your user, or if you have a more complicated situation or you just want to try out something quickly, um, just use virtual environments. And that is all I wanted to say. Okay, we have some time for questions. If anybody has a question. Um, uh, thank you. <coughs> what, what's your experience with uh, maintaining uh, <coughs> package versions in your environment? Like think uh, package.log and also what's your experience with Conda? Sorry, maintaining package versions in the environment? Um, yeah, so let's say uh, you created your environments by pip installing black one month ago and then you uh, recreated this environment on a different machine, you get slightly different versions. You, you have uh, difference in minor versions, but you have different behavior on between two. Well, I guess it depends. So me, I, I personally, for development purposes, something like black, I would just install it in user mode on, on whatever machine I'm working on and use the version available there. If I actually need a specific version for a specific project for development, I will probably make that uh, make that known in the requirements in the project itself, and then make it possible to install it into the virtual environment or through talks or some other tool to actually make it part of the development process and, and require an explicit version of that. 
So I would say it really depends on, on the situation. Um, I do often, like I have Black or PyTest and all of these tools installed in, in, on the user side because I use them all the time and I might just have a, a simple project where I just want to run PyTest too and it's available. But you can put it in your virtual and, and require an explicit version. My experience on Conda is very little. I don't use, um, I don't use it. I know mostly what it is um, and the Anaconda distribution. I think for Windows, it's it's amazing. It's probably the best way to get started with Python and, and, and Python packages. Um, I think there's actually a lot of collaboration happening between Python packaging, like the P Python packaging authority and the Conda um, or the Anaconda Corporation um, to get ideas from each other and, and just collaborate. Um, it seems to me that PIP is actually getting more and more features from Conda and, and the other way around. Um, I think it's really good. The, the one big drawback with Conda is that you have a much smaller selection of packages than what's available in PyPI, which I think is probably fine if you are doing machine learning or data science because that's really widely covered on, on Anaconda, but it might not be fine for more niche um, things. Any other questions? Yeah. Hello. Um, I had more of a question about package managers in general. It feels like we have a package manager for every day of the week, um, and there's always a new one on the horizon. Are there any plans in the open source community to try and kind of merge the package managers into one universal tool for all programming languages? Well, what do you mean by package managers? Because I think pip is still the de facto package manager for Python. If you mean more like additional tools, like I don't know, you might be m m thinking of pipend and things like that. I meant more package managers made for programming languages, so NPM, kind of Yarn. Oh, I see. Like, ju just, we have so many of them. Are there any plans just to try and kind of put them all into one? I think that's, that would be very difficult because all of these languages have f their own specific quirks and implementation details which the package managers need to keep in mind. So creating one, I think, would be a very challenging task. What, what that intersection today is, I think, is the operating systems package managers, which are general purpose package managers, and you can always use them to install like NPM or, or Python packages if they're available in the package selection. But I think um, you're encouraged to just stick to the, like, like you saw it in this presentation, if you can just avoid that and use more self-contained localized installations and just use your own programming languages um, package manager. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, is there any command in which we install all the dependency? Let's say some package one is dependent on SQLite. So as pip install that package one, SQLite is installed with this. Right, you mean native the native dependency of that yeah. Python package? Yeah. yeah, so that's actually a problem the PyPA, PyPA is looking into right now. Um, the fact that you cannot track or even express the native dependencies in a Python package is, uh, it is a problem. You basically just have to know the, that you have to install it. And what ends up happening is that you get an error while you're installing the package that X is not available and you have to Google it and then someone on Stack Overflow says that, oh, you have to install SQLite or something, which is not, not a great experience. I have to say that there is no solution to this at the moment. Um, it is being work looked at. And the idea is that, and this is actually an example where I think the PyP is looking for collaboration with the, um, the Conda or the Anaconda group because they do have something similar. And, and to make this work in a way that, um, that the PIP can somehow, um, or the Py Python packages can express external dependencies which people can somehow make available to um, external package managers, like the operating systems package manager. But this is very, very preliminary, and I think there are other people who are, actually I see one in the audience who's probably much better suited to talk about this. Yeah, Paul, yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah, you can catch him after the talk and he can give you a better answer. Yeah, not today. Cool, we have to draw it to a close there. Thank you very much, Lazo. Yep, thank uh, you. Very interesting.